my second talk in this seminar series. My first one was on uh, Gaussian, uh, it was on determinantal point processes. This one will be on Gaussian elimination. Before I get started, just a little advertisement. I'm giving uh, a lecture for Princeton Math tomorrow on determinantal point processes. Uh, it will be somewhat different from the talk I gave in this series in that it's uh, part, partly aimed a little bit more towards undergraduates, but will partly cover more some of my own research on the area. And so I, uh, this is my first of three talks I'm giving to this week. So uh, I'm going to sort of talk about what I'd like to say, but What's the like I said, like, <laughs> the third one is on Thursday. It's this Horizons lecture series at Princeton. And so this is more conversation. I have, you know, guests. We're talking about what it means to be a mathematician. And it's, there's, there's no hard math going on, but somehow organizing this, moderating, coming up with questions for people, logistics for people also takes time and energy. So, so for this talk, I have things I'd like to say, but it may not take the whole two hours. It's and, harder than that. Yes, somehow it's much harder than that, at least to me. But uh, today, I'd like to talk about uh, Gaussian elimination. And what I'd like to do in particular is just start off by reviewing what Gaussian elimination is, some basic things you should know about it, uh, very standard uh, error estimate, for Gaussian elimination. And then in the second half, I'd like to move towards a, a very interesting question in Gaussian elimination about uh, conditioning of your resulting uh, L and U, your lower triangular and upper triangular matrix. And in some sense, a question that is very old and sort of like a type of question that's been around since the 60s has yet to be answered, but also in some sense, it's not a practical one at all and no longer becomes like a question that you know, an engineer or someone implementing this in practice concern, is concerned about, but what is really a pure math question. And Lior has seen a little bit of this. He was at my uh, conversations in which I discussed this. Okay, so let's get started. So first of all, what is uh, Gaussian elimination? Well, this is just a uh, algorithm for solving a linear system. And, uh, and also more in some sense. It uh, gives you a factorization of your matrix A into the product of a lower triangular and upper triangular matrix. And you can use this to compute the inverse of a matrix to compute the determinant of a matrix, to look at the rank of a matrix. So you can do lots of things. And uh, this, as we'll see, is a uh, order and cube kind of. Okay. So when did Gaussian elimination sort of first get discovered or first get used? It turns out this is actually quite an old algorithm, even uh, pre-Gauss. So, this uh, dates back, well, let's just say it's old. It uh, dates back to about uh, like 100 to 200 E. And it's first appeared in uh, book eight. Of the nine chapters of math. Uh, they were not matrices. They were so matrices. Like a, a system of linear system of linear equations using this method, but not represented as matrices. Somehow, if you look at the history of sort of matrix analysis or linear algebra, what you'll see is the ideas of determinants, the ideas of these things, really predate like the idea of matrices. Like matrices came later, like even in the like 1500s, 1600s. There's a lot of work around determinants, 
matrices came later. So in some sense, there were no matrices here, but uh, linear systems to solve uh, agriculture problems, questions of like selling livestock. Yes, so it's a Chinese text, I think it's called. Chen, so far before gospel. Okay, and just to make sure we're all on the same page of what Gaussian elimination is. You do, I'm going to do a quick example for us. It's going to lead us into sort of our discussion. So here's a quick example. So suppose I want to solve a linear system. This one, well, what did we learn in like uh, undergraduate or grade school, wherever you learned how to do this? Well, you form an augmented matrix, looks like this. And what we're going to do is we're just going to subtract multiples of one row from another. Okay, and so what can we do? Well, we're going to subtract two times the first row from the second, and uh, we're going to just subtract minus one times the first row from the third. So I'll just put a little two here, a minus one here to denote that. And what do we get? We get the matrix with the first row the same, zero, four, zero, one, five, 12, and then we have one last step. We need to subtract a multiple of the second row from the third, and well, we're just going to subtract the row itself. So it's just a scaling of one. In the end, what we get is the matrix. Okay, so good. And by back substitution, you can quickly verify uh, Z is two, uh, Y is two, and X is uh, one, I think. Okay, so Gaussian elimination. But now let's take this procedure that we did. And let's try to think about this. So really what we did is we wrote a matrix vector equation, AX equals B, and we subtracted multiples of rows from each other, which is equivalent to multiplying by a lower triangular matrix. So what you should think we did is we multiplied by two lower triangular matrices on both sides where our first lower triangular matrix has ones in the diagonal. And simply what we did is we subtracted two times the first row from the second, so a minus two here. And we subtracted minus one times the first row from the third. So I'll put a one here. Okay. And similarly for the all two, And the way that you get out your LU factorization here is just by noting that at the end, what we got is an upper triangular matrix. And so we have something that looks like L2, L1, A equals some matrix U, which we have there. And we can simply define this to be L inverse. And what do we get? We get A equals LU, where here L 
it's just equal to L1 inverse, L2 inverse, and uh, a nice property of uh, matrices of this form, these lower triangular matrices, it's a very nice trick. Uh, the inverse of this is actually exactly the same, just uh, negating these entries below row one, negating these entries below row two. So this you can verify by quick analysis. And then the second nice property of these lower triangular matrices is when they're of this form, multiplying them is just like uh, filling in the entries below the diagonal. So you get like this L is just one, two minus one, one. Okay, so this is our basic example of Gaussian elimination, but through this basic three by three example, we see how these row operations give us a lower triangular matrix, an upper triangular matrix, and how these entries are just given by the sort of factors that we need to subtract by, which we'll see have a sort of like determinantal interpretation, which we'll get to. Okay. So far, so good. Everything, this is all. There should be no questions, but if there are, let me know. Okay, good. Now, one thing to note that is a problem here in uh, Gaussian elimination is that, uh, you know, I talked about this A equals LU factorization. The problem is not every matrix has this. So for instance, you know, let's just say this matrix has no LU factorization. So this means that we, in order to sort of do this procedure, sometimes we'll need to uh, do pivoting. We may need to interchange rows or interchange columns or something of this sort, okay? And so what you should note is that uh, what we do have is every non-singular matrix Has what we call a PA um, factorization, where P is just a permutation matrix. And you permit just on one side, don't. Uh, permit on both sides? So you can permute on both sides, but you actually don't need to, if you think about it. So for instance, suppose you're going through Gaussian elimination, and at some step, every entry in an entire column is zero. This means your matrix is singular. You also shouldn't permute both sides, right? Because if you permute both sides of that matrix, you don't get a value factorization. It stays the same. Well, uh, well, there are, so for instance, there are algorithms which do permute both sides and put different permutations. Ah, so I, I think what the PAP, right? PAP minus one is a. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Right. right. You shouldn't dream of this, but I think what we were sort of asking about is something of this form. Yeah, so, so that is fine. Yeah, that is fine. Yeah, of course, what you say, yeah, you should not do this. Yeah, I, I agree. But uh, yes, of course, you can do this as well, but uh, you only, this is enough for existence. But uh, of course, you know, often when you learn pivoting in school, sometimes you only permute rows, but sometimes you want to permute rows and columns. And so of course, if you have this, you also have that. But yes, we will get to this sort of representation. Okay. And one thing to note is that this, uh, this permuting procedure, it's not just so that we have the existence here. You also need this permuting procedure to make sure that when you have, let's say a well-conditioned matrix A, you want your factorization, you want your L and U to both be well-conditioned. So, you know, just a slight variation on this theme here. If we take, let's say this very simple matrix where I just put an epsilon in the top left, well, when you do your factorization, you're going to get something that looks like this. Leave. Yeah. 
right? And well, of course, this is extremely well conditioned, but this is a uh, very ill conditioned. So what do I mean by ill conditioned? So uh, the condition number of the matrix, let's say the two norm or you know, you could think uh, infinity norm or that, even- That's something that they verge with epsilon goes to zero. That's the- Something that's, uh, so here you see that uh, epsilon, let's say as epsilon goes to zero, this entry is getting very large. And so this is, this is an issue for us. Let's, for our purposes, we could, for simplicity, let's think of conditioning as maximum uh, absolute value of an entry. Yeah, but all these things are well, maximum is not very really well defined. Everything can be scaled. You want probably the ratio. Of the ratio, yes. And the ratio now is not uh, is not obvious that it's it, you know the gap is quadratic between the condition number of the input and right. If you don't have epsilon or epsilon square, yeah, or one, you know, epsilon over one minus epsilon is just epsilon square. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So the gap in in uh, you know, between having epsilon. And having uh, epsilon squared is not that big. I mean, when you say very ill condition, I'm not still sure what you mean. Okay. So if we look at this matrix, this matrix is well conditioned, even as epsilon goes to zero. No, no, what, yeah. So what is well conditioned? You, we could, uh, you know, if we normalize the matrix, multiply all the entries by five, mm -hmm. you know, there is uh, eigenvalue will change, but. Uh, you know, the by factor of five. So you need something absolute. Yes, and so we should say with respect to our initial matrix. Like as epsilon is going to zero. With respect to the what the eigenvalues of the way of thinking like that you want why, why don't you define any definition? Okay, I'll give you okay, so I was hoping to sort of a uh, yeah. number that will see the difference between the okay, so I was hoping to sort of save seven minutes for later, but here let's uh let's do use the following definition. Uh with some sort of continuity. Why don't we say something like this? Uh maximum entry of uh UIJ divided by maximum entry of AIJ. Let's look at this quality, for instance, which I'll define to be, uh, I'll just call this. Yeah. So it's a relative definition. Yeah. Not yeah, it's not an absolute, it's a relative yeah. definition and any sort of definition in the sense needs That's to fine. be relative. Okay. Fine. I guess you want and, both of them to be. Yeah, I guess, what about the end? Yeah. Uh, so here in our procedure, we always keep ones on the diagonals. Now, of course, things are going bad for L, but for the type of pivoting strategies that are used in practice, L usually satisfies like maximum entry being like at most one. The magnitude. You can again I'll multiply one by a constant. You can agree that L will have maximum entry one. No. That's easy to write. Yeah, we can let's just scale it. Okay. But this is something we're moving towards. So a question, an important question, which we will move towards is asking, how does this behave under certain structural conditions? Okay. But the idea that I want to get across is it's not just we're pivoting so that we have existence, we're pivoting so that we avoid sort of like blow up in some sense. And the order of operations may map, not the yes. permutations, I mean the order of yeah. uh, removing the uh, you know, subtracting loads from other loads. Okay. Good. So the idea here is if we have something like this, now when we attempt to solve our linear system, we may get answers that are quite wrong if we're using, let's say, uh, floating point arithmetic, point finite precision. So the whole idea is we would like to choose our P, or in this case, choose our P and Q, such that the L and U we get out do not have entries that are too large relative to the initial matrix. And here, to make things fairly obvious, I'll call this row of U, I'll call this row of L. Uh, 
And what we're after is some procedure for deciding P and Q such that these two things do not grow very large. Okay, so far so good. So in practice, there are two procedures that uh, are actually sort of used. And perhaps you've, you know, you've heard of these things, partial pivoting and complete pivoting. Okay. So partial pivoting is simply Just setting the pivot to be the largest entry in the row. So we're doing a step of Gaussian elimination. We look at all the rows and we want to see what's the largest magnitude entry in that given column. And we move that to be the first row. Say it one more time. Largest <laughs> entry in column. Largest entry in the leftmost column. So, for instance, looking back at our example, here at the first step, we would permute, we would swap rows two and one because four is larger in magnitude than two. Uh, this step, we would be fine, and that step would be fine. And this partial pivoting would give you a PA equals LU factorization, right? because we're just permuting rows. Okay. The second procedure is called complete pivot. And here, what we do is we just ask the pivot to be the largest entry in magnitude in the entire matrix. So again, looking at this uh, example we did, at the first step, we would uh, swap rows one and two and also swap uh, columns one and two so that the nine would be at the top left. Okay, and then at the second step, we would swap rows two and three and columns two and three so the five would be in the top left. Okay. And historically, sort of in sort of practice and also in sort of like uh, actual computer implementation, these are by far the two most popular procedures you'll see. And so much so that I feel pretty comfortable saying that they sort of dwarf all other procedures, though there are other techniques like uh, rook pivoting and other things. So for instance, rook pivoting would be choosing your largest pivot to be the uh, largest entry in the first column and first row. So good. Okay. So, giving you a quick example, I've sort of shown you how these row operations really correspond to uh, multiplication by lower triangular matrices. We've looked at why pivoting is important, not just for sort of existence of the factorization, but also for this conditioning, which I claim is important, but I haven't actually shown you yet. And so next, I'd like to just formally describe this Gaussian elimination algorithm because, well, we've sort of seen it in a very, you know, uh, sort of step-by-step -step numerical procedure, but it'd be nice to think about it more holistically. And then what I'd like to do is sort of prove what I consider to be like a very standard, typical error estimate for this that shows you why these matter. And to do this, we'll have to define some sort of uh, floating point of it. Okay, good. So let's give. No, this doesn't move this board. So if you the board, if you want to pull the other. Yeah, one. you're right. I probably should. Probably should. <laughs> And 
And uh, by this point, from our example, I think the uh, order and cubed part is uh, obvious because at each step, we're uh, subtracting a row, uh, you know, like order uh, k times when the matrix is uh, k by k. And yes, yeah, so you are summing up k squared from k equals n and onward. So you get n cubed. One practical detail to note is that this procedure adds uh, order n squared, whereas complete pivoting adds order n cubed. So complete pivoting actually adds, you know, some something tangible to the runtime, whereas this partial procedure does not. So if we can do this partial procedure and get away with it, we would like to. Uh, I mean, it's uh, not factor, it's constant factor, but in fact, you can implement it. You just need to find this maximum, right? Uh, could you say that again? Why is this uh, n squared? It's really, if it depends how you, you know, what's your data structure, you really don't have to put n squared to pay n squared for this. Uh, for this partial pivoting? Or for the complete pivoting, for partial pivoting. You said the complete pivoting will, total, will be a total of n cube. Yeah. Why? Uh, so at each step, you're searching for the uh, largest uh, entry. You won't do it like that. I mean, you, will, you will pick them as you, you will update them. It's a very simple update. Okay. It's a max. You'll have a, you know, a cube or a, a tree to keep where the maximum is. You won't need to search again and again. This is a very simple implement, many implementations that will do it in much less than x squared time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I don't think there is a much you know, difference in complexity in between the two. But in most cases, this you know getting the element you want to the top. Mm -hmm. Even like after the one update. update. Yeah. 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 I mean, you're sort of cheating, right? Because you're saying you you would keep it updated, but you're, you're using the fact that the algorithm is already taken. Yeah. So to keep updated. I'm not taking it. No, I'm not taking it. Just that simple data structure. No, oh, right, right. You're, you're, but the the entries are changing. Yeah. When you change, you you notice and you you keep track. Exactly. Oh, this, this, exactly. Right, right. But then you you're taking advantage. Of Okay. You do this and then you don't do the other thing. Right, right. You, you don't do that, but you're taking advantage from the fact that yeah. the algorithm itself, while it's doing calculations, yeah. already take yeah. the searching yeah. over the whole Right, right. I mean, you're not, right. it's not a right. separate Yeah, it's not a separate pro yeah. process, but if you could do that work faster, you, it would break this, right? What? If you could do the calculation faster than n squared. At each step, then you somehow magically didn't have to look at all all entries. No, of course not. Then, then, then you can do this. Well, I mean, every pivot operation is really linear, right? As you do right. it, you update right. your maximum yeah, and and whatever you want. I right. Mean, so depending on the data structure, it's not even linear; it's constant, right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's all my point. It's not, it's not an additional problem. Okay. So, I'll say that uh, typically, when if you read about Gaussian elimination, any numerical analysis textbook or any numerical linear algebra textbook. Typically, partial pivoting is preferred because complete pivoting will add more sort of, uh, will increase your runtime in a noticeable way, whereas partial pivoting will not. Now, depending on what data structure is used, how this is implemented, this may be, you know, this may depend on some things. But for the purposes of what we're looking at, partial pivoting is preferred in practice. If you look at LINPAC, partial pivoting is uh, implemented. Complete pivoting is very historical in many ways. For instance, complete pivoting, it's not even clear who came up with this. For instance, like uh, John von Neumann, when he was sort of you know, working on Gaussian elimination, he, even back in the 40s, said complete pivoting as a strategy was like extremely well known. So it's not clear when you know <laughs> where these techniques came from but i should say complete pivoting was in many ways preferred in practice early on but as soon as you know doing this on computers became a thing partial pivoting is what's actually coded because what you'll notice is that well, what we'll talk about is that in practice it tends to be good enough and it's obviously cheaper than complete pivoting Can you, can you explain? I'm sorry, something that I'm not experiencing. Why does that helpful putting the the oh, you'll see an analysis. You'll yeah, we'll get there. Okay. If you if it's not clear, then this is this is good. If it's not clear, it's good. This means that like 
by the end, I'll have to show you something. Can I ask you real quick? Yeah. Is there a name for the following strategy that maybe is not practical at all, but like compute the determinantal minors that don't change when you multiply on the left by L or on the right by U, and then look at the sizes of these, and based on the relative sizes, choose your permutation in advance. You don't know L and U. You would get them at the end. You don't know L and U, but there's a certain collection of indeterminate minors of dimensions one, two, three, all the way up through N that don't change when you multiply on the left and the right by U. Yeah. And based on the sizes of these, I mean, I think if you, we started this two by two example, we could you know, see what I mean. Um, you could try to guess which permutation is relevant. Yeah, well, using the determinant is the costliest solving the system. Yeah, in some sense, okay. like in yeah, how costly is computing the determinant? Okay. And Q, and Q like for instance, okay. Gaussian elimination would be one way to compute yeah. the determinant. Okay, so for all these, we're kind of fighting against constants. So. Yeah, so yeah, computing the determinant you should think is as expensive as you know the thing we're we're doing because what we're doing is actually computing the determinant. And the point is to optimize the constant for the runtime rather than to optimize the conditioning or some. So secondary. here, what we're going to talk about eventually is looking at these strategies, or we can talk about others and trying to minimize the condition or try to minimize, let's say, this uh, row of u row. Of okay. But uh, but this determinantal idea is a very reasonable one, and in fact, you can think about. And we'll get to this. You can think about this complete pivoting or partial pivoting actually as determinantal conditions. These are actually saying conditions about I am pivoting based off sort of like uh, ratios of determinants and sort of trying to maximize something. Although that's not what we're actually computing in practice, you'll see that it has this interpretation. Okay, good. So let me write down this algorithm pretty formally just so. We're all on the same page. So as our input, we take in some matrix A, N by N. And just to make our lives easy, let's just say our matrix comes pre-permuted, whichever permutation procedure we want to do. And we have the property that the uh, leading K by K principal submatrices are all non singular which I'll use using the sort of MATLAB type notation, row one to K, column one to K, the matrix result. And all this algorithm does is uh, K equals one all the way to N minus one. What do we do? Well, take this matrix A, We look at uh, we look at the entries below the pivot, and we just divide by the pivot. So we scale. So I'm just going to divide this by a pivot, and then the last thing we do is we take this scaled vector and we just multiply it by this row, and we subtract from the lower block matrix. That's functionally what we're doing. where uh, this divide equals just means we take this, divide by that, and save it here. This minus equals is we compute this product and subtract it from this and save it here. And this is the whole algorithm. And the uh, A that we get out at the end is simply uh, this part is U, and this part is uh, L, but uh, without the diagram. So the A we have at the end holds both our L and our U. So fairly straightforward to write. And now
let's just take a little brief uh, side note to talk about floating point arithmetic and uh, sort of basic assumption we'll take. Any questions so far? Yep. Okay, so. So suppose we have some function that takes real numbers to some set f, and you should think this is just a uh, rounding procedure. We take in a number and we just try to send it to the closest number in the set f. This is value. And this function satisfies the property that uh, we give it an x and what we get out equals x times one plus delta, where delta is always at most some value u, which we call the unit round off. And uh, for instance, if uh, you're doing this with some base beta and like a mantissa of length t, then you would be uh, beta to the power of uh, one minus t over two. So it's good to think of f as the rationals or the rationals with some. Um, some, well, let's say the rationals with a restriction. With all the yeah, yeah, exactly. And the tissa, and the tissa length. T, I'll just put u. just for uh, concreteness okay. to help give some insights. And now we are going to assume something. This is often called the uh, fundamental axiom of floating point arithmetic. So like this is often used in numerical analysis textbooks. Uh, I think this was first perhaps coined by uh, Nick Trefethen in uh, his numerical linear algebra book. But the, uh, the axiom is as follows. Axiom functionally says that uh, what we have here also holds for all our standard operations, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. What, what, you, what for? So here, um, uh, yeah, I'll, I just wanted to say before I wrote, so uh, for any x and y and, f and uh, some operation, which is, uh, Let's say there exists some delta such that float of x up y is equal to x up y times one plus delta. Okay. So it's just saying we take two floating point numbers, we add them, we subtract them, we multiply them, and we divide them. And then that do you want to start with x and y not in f? Uh, in no, I, I want x and y in f. And the reason why but is that the, the, the alt stays in f. Not necessarily, because I haven't told you anything about f really yet. And even if you think about, suppose you imagine f is let's say you know some rational numbers with some you multiply them all of a sudden this is no longer in your set because we're fixing the length right and so what we want is to say that we take something we want to put it in f we don't lose too much and then we have everything in f and we do standard operations and we want to say every time we do a standard operation we may get something not in f but when we bring it back into F, we know that it is close to what it exactly should be. Okay. Good.
So next, I'll give you a pretty standard and also decently short proof for uh, error estimate for Gaussian elimination. And then we'll take a quick break, I think would be, be a good time for a break. And then I'll dig into sort of some more, um, I would say less standard type, uh, type things and more skewed towards sort of the questions I'd like to sort of introduce to all of you. Okay. So what I'd like to do is convince you all that uh, this maximum entry of L or maximum entry of U is something that uh, shows up in error estimates. So let me just define uh, uh, this absolute value sign of A to just be maximum modulus of any entry. Okay. And Here's a fairly standard theorem. This you can find in like uh, Donald Van Lowen and also many other places. And it's as follows. So suppose we have some matrix A, plus one by N. the computed L and U, and by computed, I mean from this algorithm. Of course, satisfying the assumptions of the algorithm. Satisfy L times U equals A plus some matrix H, where the maximum Magnitude of any entry of H is at most two and minus one. So what is this saying? It's saying we take a matrix A, we do Gaussian elimination, we get a lower triangular and upper triangular matrix out. And if we multiply these two matrices together exactly in exact arithmetic, we get A back plus some error term. And this error term, each entry wise, is really, you should think, on the order of our unit round off times N, but depending on maximum magnitude of A. And now here comes the maximum magnitude of the entries of L and U. Okay. Yes. Computed in L U in F or in in the same L. Uh, computed in F. Yes. I should say. Yes. Okay. Uh, if computed not in F, then H, of course, would just be zero. It's interesting to me that there are a couple of these, I guess, uh, so, so op, when op is multiply or, or divide, and also this theorem you stated, the estimates are not homogeneous in A, meaning like you could, or okay, or in X and Y, meaning you could imagine scaling your things so that the error that you get is smaller. Yeah, so this, is that, is that, is that should I think of that as weird or? You should think of that as not actually happening here. So okay. let's, Think about this for a second. So suppose I, uh, so first of all, let's think about this result. Suppose I multiply both sides by a constant. Well, then I would get a constant here, constant here, and let's say a constant here. And we're just sort of scaling here. Yeah, so if that were the bad term, then you could choose a big constant and make that term relatively smaller. Say this again. I could make so this relatively smaller. Yeah, so, this, so the idea is, let's say you have a given matrix A, you mm -hmm. can apply your theorem to constant multiple of A, mm -hmm. and then 
your error H in this decomposition. Um, yes, but you should let's think. Let's say the U squared term is, is the bad one, right? Uh, you should not think about this uh, U squared. Practice that will not be the bad. This one. is okay. this is like our unit round off squared. So, for instance, like in uh, like uh, for uh, double precision, U is ten to the minus sixteen. Yeah, that answers my question. Right now. Okay, good. So yes, the C will show up in here, but I'm using the O for simplified analysis. But you'll see that indeed, if we scale our matrix A, then both of these terms scale by the same amount. Okay. Okay, and the proof is uh, not too bad. This is we're just going to do this proof by induction on it. Okay, so I'll sketch this for you. So and, and we can close here n is at least two because well, n equals one is trivial. Okay. So let's write our matrix A in block notation. We'll denote the pivot by alpha. The first row by W transpose, the first column by, by V, and the lower right block by B. So this is one column, one row, and B is N minus one by N minus one. Okay. Our algorithm is doing three things. So we're going to have uh, error due to floating point arithmetic in three places. What are these three places? Well, let me define a couple things. So our algorithm computes what I'll call z hat, which is just float of v divided by alpha. So that's just our first step. And next, we're going to compute this matrix, which I'll just call c hat, which is just float of z hat. W transpose, we take what we computed here, multiply it by W transpose, and then finally, I'll define a one hat to be the float of B by the C hat. So, yeah, this is a scalar product, the Z hat W transpose? Uh, this is uh, exterior product. So this is a column and this is a row, so this becomes a matrix. I see, okay. Yes. So yes, yeah, so B, is uh, an n minus length n minus one column vector w transpose is a length n minus one row vector. This z hat is just taking this column vector divided by a uh, scalar, and yeah, okay, good. Yeah, it takes a second to. I I, I never. It's it, it, hard to me when it's a product and when it's a yeah yeah in, I'm, in an outer, yeah. I, I I agree. <laughs> I fully agree. Okay, so now let's look at each of these things under our fundamental axiom. Okay, so by our fundamental axiom, we can write this as the actual, we can write z hat as the actual v divided by alpha plus some f, where f is at most u was the magnitude of V over alpha. And we can do a similar thing for C and uh, A1. So here we're just writing our C hat using this fundamental axiom and we're saying this F1 is not too large. And now we can rewrite our A1 as the difference between B and C hat plus some extra term. And this extra term So 
we'll see is where we get this u squared that I don't really want to carry around. And that's just because this F2 is representing something that already has some u, and we're getting another u, and I just don't want to carry this around. So a more precise analysis can give you what's actually there, but we should think of this as small. Okay. And uh, one good thing to just note by looking at this is that this A1 hat is at most B. Plus something of and essentially all we're going to do is we're going to assume that our a1 hat has the property we want because we're doing induction and then we're going to verify that uh, we still get what we want so this is very much we're very much just checking that what we hope should be true is indeed true so I'll go through this fairly quickly and then we'll take a break. Okay, so uh, by our hypothesis. So let's take this, get our B, get this here. Uh, F1 is U times something. F2 under the U is right there. Something of order u. So if you wanted, so if I actually wrote out what was here, it would be u times this. Oh, I see. Okay. Plus uh, okay. u plus u times that yeah, plus order u squared. Yeah. Okay. So by our hypothesis, we can write a one plus some h1 equals what I'll call L1 hat times U1 hat, where h1 satisfies this hypothesis just for N1 smaller. I'm not gonna write it for you, but we can just see that. And our actually computed L and U is just taking this L1 and adding in this computed Z. And for u hat, we just keep our alpha, keep our that we transpose. And so all that's left to do is we're just going to multiply this L and u. We're going to get our h, and we're going to see very quickly that uh, h is going to satisfy this. Okay. So. For the sake of time, I'm going to save you all seeing this long computation and hopefully you trust me that when I multiply this L and U, what do I get out? Well, I get my A back plus H, where H takes the following form. Alpha F in the lower left-hand corner and H1 minus F1 plus F2. Now, checking that this, uh, the entries in alpha F satisfy this are pretty straightforward because uh, alpha F, well, this is at most U, I mean U times the largest entry B just by definition, well, by how we define F. And well, you'll see V, is uh, just in the first column of A. So this definitely holds. So all that's left is to check this lower right-hand block. Okay, and well, at this point, I think, well, would you like me to write it out or? No, I see no. So at this point, you'll see that H1 satisfies this for N1 smaller, and we have exact bounds on F1 and F2. 
And when we combine these, we're going to add at most two, okay? Because we get uh, Z hat W transpose one. And this is the proof of this error estimate, okay? So what have we done so far? We've introduced Gaussian elimination. We've talked a little bit about pivoting procedures and I've now convinced you that when we're doing Gaussian elimination in practice, the error that we run into very much depends on the largest entry of A and the largest entry of our computed L and U. And so we'll take a little break. And when we come back, we'll look at these, uh, these two pivoting procedures I talked about before, or we'll just look at more pivoting procedures in general. And we'll look at estimates for these quantities and some uh, questions that still remain. Okay. So maybe we'll take a five minute break. Yeah. Did you understand? Yeah. Not that important. Originally, he said A is very well conditioned with that in that example. But I mean, this, what does that mean? No, I think for him, for him it's just let's say that uh, not the century is a small company, right? It's a it's only okay. normalization condition because at the end, yeah. uh, his yeah. notion of uh, well condition is relative to it. I guess my issue is I see all this well condition is all the time. There's always a different definition. Yeah, there are always different definitions. Yeah. Yeah. I see the most standard is the ratio between the, uh, the ratio between the drop and the yeah. bottom. Yeah. 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 The most yeah, there, uh, anyway, you want some? Like yeah. <laughs> Are you really free? Yeah. Hold on. Oh, Uncle, maybe there's not an, an absolute. Yeah. <laughs> it's very clever. Yeah. I'm going to blanket here and I'm going to blanket it. <laughs> The Princeton. From someone, it's from Mascan or Oh no, this is from Wawa. Oh Wawa, wow. okay, yeah, cool. They sell blankets. Yeah, they do. Wow. Right down the street, local. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should have had them all the time. That's what students make. <laughs> Wawa blankets. So Wawa is selling everything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, if, if, they make, if they have blankets, I guess so that's what they make. We have the number theory seminar yet? Like, like somehow even in the winter they're like piping in freezing cold air. <laughs> I know, I'm, I, I, I'm relatively sensitive to cold. I don't feel that. Uh, I mean, in our house, and I, uh, you know, compete. I turn the heat on, she turns it down. Okay, not on the outside itself. <laughs> It'll be back next week. Supposed to be, uh, yeah, it will come. Supposed to be global warming. <laughs> Sounds like a Republican at the House Committee. Yeah, I know. <laughs> yeah, you have a wolf. Yeah. yeah. I think now they call it climate change. Specifically, <laughs> it's not even. <laughs> It's not that it's wrong to call it global warming, it's just that people will bring in a snowball and say that you're wrong. I think it helps in dealing with it, but... Yeah. It's helped with dealing with some of the people that <laughs> criticize. <laughs> Only some. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Decision -making. Yeah, it's, it's like, once you say like climate change, it's, it's trivially, right? It's, tri it's, it's, trivial, it's trivially... Uh, uh, 
Uh, yeah, but it doesn't mean that the market is too Suppose it was uh, getting colder, maybe you would like to increase the you know, production of uh, you know, the use of uh, coal and everything, right? Maybe you. I, I like the article from The Economist that said, well, you have to understand that when global warming uh, melts the ice caps, we're going to end up with new trading routes in uh, Canada because uh, there'll be so many more passages that are underwater. Like, if you can make that kind of an argument, well, I guess. Uh, that's <laughs> where uh, we should invest on. Yeah, exactly. Wait, why underwater? Yeah, well, it'll flood, it, it'll create more routes oh. by which uh, freight can you could get to Russia more easily. Yeah, exactly. Interesting, though, because in northern Canada, their levels are going down. I guess. What's so, going on? Uh, the water levels. Really? Really? Yeah. Going down? Oh, yeah. well, we need to burn more coal. Like in Ontario, I don't know the West Coast. But yeah. Really? Yeah. Is it, is it like water that is connected to the ocean or is it like uh, contained? I think it's connected. I have to look it up. Yeah, so it's like. Uh, Maybe there's uh, laws of physics as well as this kind of thing. No, you have you have things, for example, in in a lot, the water is much lower. Yeah. Lake Ontario. Yeah, because if, if you have something which is very I narrow and a lot think, of heat. Lake Ontario is probably Lake Ontario not, is not there. Lake Ontario is probably not yeah, we're gonna be a trading route though. It's in the middle of it's isolated. So I don't think Lake Ontario is Yeah, I don't I, think I, it is either <laughs> No, a, a lake, a lake I would guess it would down because it's uh, without the heat. Yes. Yeah. That, that, I see. Uh, anything connected. Yeah. Yeah. I have to look. There's another one I'm thinking of. Yeah. I think it's. Yeah, it's something interesting that we've listened to. I saw the other day, which is probably trivial, but that's the first time I've seen it. So there are all kinds of maps uh, from uh, all kinds of. Uh, Companies uh, that sell information of sail of sailing boats, and you can see all like an actual map of like all the sailing boat, all, all of the not sailing uh, cargo cargo ships yeah, yeah. Uh, around around the world, mm -hmm. uh, with like their symbol on the map, and you're looking at the U.S. and suddenly you see <clears throat> tons inland, and you and you're like what? <laughs> and at the minute, at the first time. It, First year, so the water, water level rose. What water level rose? Yeah, have some bears. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. bears. Uh, <laughs> okay, wait a minute. Uh, we'll uh, <laughs> let John uh, do it. <laughs> all right, so <laughs> back to where so let's finish up and then uh, talk about all these things at lunch. Uh, okay, so let's just get back into this Gosh elimination. Uh, here I'm using a little bit more involved notation. What we're doing is we have a matrix A. We're creating a sequence of matrices A1, A2, all the way to AN, where A1 is n by n, A2 is n minus 1 by n minus 1, the lower right block, and so on until we just have one entry. And I'm indexing these. AI is indexed from I to N. So we can think of these as like belonging in the same big matrix. We're just doing our rank one update. And the lower and upper triangular matrices, upper triangular matrices are just given by these uh, entries, A, I, J at step I, this first row, and L, I, J is just the ratio of the pivot to entries in the first column, okay? Uh, I alluded to this earlier based off your question. These entries actually have a determinantal representation or interpretation, say. So if you look at, let's say, step K, and you look at entry IJ, you should think if you move that entry to the pivot, what you actually have is like an upper triangular matrix times sort of a part of the lower triangular matrix where there's all ones in the diagonal. And so in some sense, this is actually telling you something about the ratio of the determinants of everything that came before, plus adding the row and column corresponding to I and J. So you should think of this as the determinant 
of A, where we index it from one to K minus one. And we also add an I, and then one to K minus one. We also add in J. Divided by the determinant of what's come before. So A minus one. So this, I and J are both at least K. And I and J are always at least K, and I should write that here as well. Because at step K, we have uh, it's going from K to N and K to N. All right, so because this has this determinantal representation, we can actually think about our pivoting procedures are actually conditions on determinants of some matrices because, uh, well, just to remind you, because it's not written anywhere anymore, partial pivoting. Just saying AIK step K is at most a pivot. And uh, complete pivoting just has an AIJ at step K. And so even though we aren't computing any determinants, well, we are computing determinants, but we aren't, you should note that these procedures have some property about maximizing some determinant. And in fact, like complete pivoting, you should think of as the following procedure. I have an N by N matrix. I want to maximize the uh, one by one determinant at magnitude. And then I do a step and conditional on my choice, I now want to pick my next row and column to maximize the two by two determinant in the top left and so on and so forth. So it's like an iterative determinant maximization. Uh, it's not the one by one, two by two, it's really the diagonal entries of you, right? Yeah, it's the diagonal entries of you, which yeah, give you this, yeah, give you this interpretation. Yeah, but these like diagonal entries are corresponding to like these. Because it's an upper triangle. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, yes, this is perhaps obvious. So, okay. And what we're going to look at for the rest of the time or really focus on is uh, what I'll define as the growth factor, which for uh, partial pivoting, complete pivoting, you should think of as uh, completely equivalent to this like row of U, which I defined above. So for both of these procedures, you'll note that this row of L, the maximum magnitude entry of L is just one. And so I'll just define Growth factor G of A to be the maximum magnitude entry we encounter divided by the maximum entry of A. Now for the rest of the time, the question we want to answer is how large can this thing be for these two conditions or in general? Growth factor has any implication in terms of the numerics? Uh, yes, so yes, I can write that for you right now. So based on the result I proved for you before the break, you can uh, you can show the following thing with you know just a tiny bit of work. Suppose you want to solve x equals b, and uh, you use this uh, Gaussian elimination procedure to do this. You get some approximate solution x hat out, and your solution x hat will be such that a plus e 
x hat equals b. And this matrix E will satisfy the following bound. And here I'm using uh, infinity norms. Okay. So not the entry wise I was using prior. This is at most like uh, six and cubed both of A and for the norm. We're here, they're scaling so that we're taking things from L and putting them on U, but for what we're looking at, the growth always occurs to me. So you should think what's controlling this? Well, it's really the growth. Okay, good. So that's so far so good. Although I do want to stress that the theoretical question of you know how large can this growth factor be very much leaves the realm of practicality, I think, very quickly. So although you know I can show you this and I can tell you this. I think I would be sort of like misleading you if I told you that uh, somehow a stronger bound on this growth factor was some great practical like accomplishment. That's a very weird uh, kind of uh, you know way of parameterizing the quality of X set. Usually, you want to say that X set is close to X. Yes, this is a very roundabout way of saying it. Yeah, yeah. No, this. I mean, this is just one. This is one way for me to say this while sh sort of showing you that this, the answer to this question is very much governed by growth. So here you'll note that, uh, you know, I'm not fully using anything about the conditioning of A, like how large, you know, the two norm of A and its inverse are. Here is really growth of A and it's because of the way I parameterize this, which of course do we know what's the quality of X set relative to X? What the yeah, so this X will X set in some norm. So this will depend on both growth and condition number, which you should think in the style of the previous result. But both will appear. But this is just the one sort of key type of estimate in which this is governing what's going on. All right. So our question is how big does uh, G of A get, let's say under partial or complete? And again, I want to give the disclaimer that here we're asking a question about how large does it get in the extreme, uh, questions about how large it gets in average case or in smooth case have also been studied. And for instance, uh, let me sort of give you some sense of what's going on. Uh, there's a paper of Perfethen and uh, Schreiber from 1990 which shows that uh, experimentally, if you take, let's say a matrix with uh, entries mean zero, variance like one over root n, what you'll see is a growth factor typically n to the two thirds for partial pivoting, n to the one half for complete pivoting. Uh, there are smooth analysis results of like Sarkar, Spielman, and Tang, both for uh, without pivoting. And in Sarkar's MIT, PhD thesis with uh, partial pivoting, which somehow perhaps counterintuitively, but in some sense intuitively, worse estimates are obtained just simply because it's very difficult to constantly contain, to constantly manage this like partial pivoting condition. Whereas if you have no pivoting conditions, you can sort of like, you know what your matrix is gonna look like when you do things. But we're looking at sort of worst case behavior here. Okay, like, just get to get a sense. You would typically be some polynomial in N. Uh, you think that's polynomial in N? Yeah. Uh, in practice, you should think of U as fixed, but often if you want to think of it as growing as N, you should think of like uh, log, log N. 
but it's going to fight this NQ. And, uh... Oh, sorry. Yeah, you should think of you behaving like some polynomial in N, the number of, yeah, your T is like log N. Sorry, yeah. yeah not you. This is a T. English polynomial in N. It's just T log N. Yeah, yeah. Your number of bits, you should think the number of bits you need is like log N. Yeah. 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 Obviously. Yeah. But uh, yeah, like on, you pull up like MATLAB or Python or something, this will be 10 to the minus. Well, it'll be exactly like 2 to the minus 52. All right, so for partial pivoting, there's actually a really easy answer. So this has been known for quite a long time to the extent that uh, I'm not even sure who first found this, I think Wilkinson, but uh, it's such a simple and obvious sort of type of construction that you know who knows who first saw this. Uh, for partial pivoting, let me just give you the following matrix. So I'm going to put ones on the diagonal, ones in the last column, zeros here, and minus ones here. And what you'll notice is as I do a step of Gaussian elimination, what happens? Well, first of all, we note that it's partially pivoted. There's going to be no fill in here. What's going to happen is the entries of this column are going to double. So after one step, this we're going to go to this, and eventually we'll be left with two to the n minus one, and this is in fact tight because. Uh, I have it up here. You'll notice that at any step, what are we doing? We're taking a number from the previous step and we're subtracting some number from the previous step scaled by the ratio of an entry in the first column to the pivot, which by partial pivoting is always at most one. So that means we get at most doubling at each step and this is exactly attained by this matrix. So. This question, I just answered it for partial pivoting. We're half done. And that means the right example of bits is uh, useless. Yes, although I should stress that this feels like a very contrived example. And in practice, you're very rarely going to see a growth this large. You know, like I told you before, if you look at LAPAC, you know, this, uh, but this here is not, it may be contrived, but it's not like a ridiculous matrix, right? That's yeah. the plus minus one and zero. It's, uh, looks like a pretty, it's even almost triangular, it looks pretty decent. Yeah, oh, okay, then let's argue for complete pivoting is important. I like this. Yeah. I like this argument. Yes, yes. okay. I mean, do you know, do you know Han, if you perturb this by epsilon, how does the two to the n minus one get destroyed? Yes, so. It uh, so if you do like uh, it does not take much of a perturbation to uh, break this. It like, does not take because much. imagine if you just make something large a little larger than one here, all of a sudden we break the structure. Yeah, but I mean, wouldn't it be perfecting the right hand side problem? Uh, no, because we'll get sort of fill in here, which will affect entries on the diagonal. We'll be doing some subtraction. Yeah. Right. yeah. For instance, like there are, like for instance, if you look at Sarkar's thesis, he actually does do smooth analysis of partial pivoting. And if you do like, uh, okay, exponentially small perturbations aren't always going to do the trick, but if you do like a polynomially small perturbation, you'll get like something that's polynomial. It's perturbed by. One over end of the fifth or something. Yeah, right? one over end of the fifth. Right. And it's just that this nice, this nice structure where we're just updating here and we're doing nothing here, which is not changing the magnitudes of the pivot entries. This is uh, this is somewhat fragile. Yeah. But but uh, 
But yeah, as, as Avi says, you know, it's just zeros and ones and minus ones, and uh, yeah, that's very, very natural looking matrix. So you can get this exponential growth, which is of course quite, quite bad. Good. And the question that we're gonna look at for sort of the last, I'm gonna say I'll take 20 more minutes is what's happening for a complete pivoting. And this is a question that is extremely poorly understood. And in fact, it's the type of problem that you see that very little has been done and all the techniques that have done something useful are extremely simple. So there are no complicated results here, but yet there are still a huge gap which sort of needs to be answered. And so hopefully maybe some of you look at this and think, this would be an interesting problem to think about. Feel free to talk to me in some sense. Okay, so for complete pivoting, what do we know? Well, there is a uh, sort of hallmark result of Wilkinson, who very much is like widely considered to be like the godfather or founder of numerical linear algebra, which uh, people have thought of People have thought of Gary. <laughs> pivotal guy. A pivotal yeah. guy. <laughs> yes, a very pivotal guy. And he had a quite pivotal result here. So this is Wilkinson, 1961. And what he proved that uh, for complete pivoting, and I should say when I'm talking about this growth factor G of A, and we say under a pivoting procedure, you should imagine we're only accepting matrices as input that when we perform Gaussian elimination, they satisfy the conditions of the pivoting procedure which you should think of as equivalent to, we'll take any non-singular matrix, we do Gaussian elimination, we pivot as we go. That's the same as sort of choosing the pivoting beforehand, you know, choosing while doing it and choosing it beforehand. It's the same. So just in case there was a little confusion there, for complete pivoting, this growth is at most square root n times this uh, strange looking product here, which I really want you to think of as two square root n, n to like the log n over four. So super polynomial, but much better than the exponential bound for partial pivoting. And the way you prove this, I just because of time, I don't want to prove this exactly, but I can give you a little sort of a sketch. Sketch is uh, actually incredibly simple. We're only going to use Hadamard's inequality. Okay, so if you look at uh, let's say matrix matrix at uh, the kth step, well, this is just equal to the product of our pivots from K all the way to N. And if you simply use Hadamard's inequality on each of these matrices, well, what you'll get is that uh, you'll get that uh, the largest magnitude entry to uh, N minus K plus one, that's prettiest times uh, n minus k plus one, uh, plus one over two is an upper bound for the 
the magnitude of this determinant. So you have an inequality for every k, and then simply sort of adding them up in an intelligent way is how you get this bound. This is the only property you use. Okay, so this is functionally minus like very minor improvements you can make. This is functionally the best upper bound for complete pivoting we have. It's from the 60s and it only uses Helmholtz inequality. Okay. Now, what's the inequality, by the way? Ah, sure. Uh, so, so Helmholtz inequality. Just says that if you uh, take, let's say, the determinant of the matrix B, that what's at most the product of the uh, lengths of its columns. B. This columns B1 to, let's say, Bn. Good. Okay, and this is really like the best anyone can do. And as far as lower bounds, I'd like to show you a quick little result. Of a uh, high of a time. From the year I didn't write it, but I believe it's 1992. And the results as follows. Suppose, suppose you have some matrix A. It's non-singular. And let's define. the maximum magnitude entry of A times the maximum magnitude entry of A inverse. And take the inverse of that. Okay. So they say two things. The first is trivial. The second one is also easy to show, but it, it's not, it shows you something not trivial. The first thing they say, is this theta is at most n. And the second thing they say is that uh, for all permutation matrices P and Q, such that uh, you do have an LU factorization, the uh, growth factor for P and Q is at least theta. Okay, so this is a way to get a lower bound. Uh, theta being at most n, this is actually really easy. This just follows from the definition of an inverse. So uh, for, uh, for an inverse, well, what do you have? You have that if you multiply a matrix by its inverse, what do you get out? You get the identity matrix, right? So this is just like a sum j equals one to n of aij, a inverse ji. You know for uh, whatever I chose, this is one. And well, if you plug in this theta, you note that theta should not be any more than n because if theta is more than n, then each of these terms is smaller than one over n and we're not going to get to one. So that part is easy. The second part is what happens to that if I take a sequence of non-singular matrix converging to a singular matrix? So you give me a sequence of non-singular matrices. Uh, well, well, I, I, I attempt to, towards something which is singular. Uh -huh. What happened to that? Uh, if you go towards something that's singular, then won't theta go to zero? Because uh, oh, it's this is going to go yeah, to yeah, infinity. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Okay. Uh, and then for two, this is also a pretty uh, straightforward result, which I can sort of show pretty quickly. So let's just take uh, a and n inverse. Uh, what you'll note is that this is just the same as taking the inverse of our u and finding the bottom right entry. But uh, so far so good. But here, and I should note that sort of it's by standard assumption that L always has ones on the diagonal. This is by convention. But because it's the last entry, I can actually put in my L inverse as well because it doesn't change the specific entry. And then all I do is I simply substitute in my uh, permuted matrix A. Transposes. And what am I getting out? I'm just getting out some entry of A in. Right. And I don't know which one it is. We're taking a permutation, but it's it's just some entry. Right. So far, so good. And so you'll note that this already immediately gives us the result we want because uh, the maximum of EIJ. Okay. Well, this is, of course, greater than or equal to and n, which by this that we just gave is at least maximum entry of our inverse matrix to the minus one. And that completes the proof. One thing to note is, uh, for instance, this is one way to show that if you have a Hadamard matrix, that uh, Hadamard achieves this uh, factor of n, which I can show you pretty quickly. So a Hadamard matrix is just a uh, n by n matrix where hn times hn transpose equals n times the identity matrix. So this means that our uh, hn inverse is just one over n transpose. And so you get uh, this n factor exactly out. So these Hadamard matrices are uh, plus minus one matrices. Okay. So what do we have so far? We have this Wilkinson bound that gives us this uh, sort of super polynomial estimate. And we have a lower bound that of N that's achieved by Hadamard matrices. And so it was actually conjectured that this growth factor is actually really N. So is really N. So, Conjecture made by uh, most people cite Cryer, but I have seen Wilkinson actually cited so here well as well. Although Cryer, I feel very confident made this conjecture. Wilkinson, this may have been a conversation. I can't find an actual citation of this. They conjectured that uh, you have matrix A. It's uh, n by n, real, one singular. And uh, under complete pivoting, of course, what we've been talking about, this growth is at most n and achieved by a head of our babies.
Okay, and this conjecture is from like the 60s. And uh, there was sort of a, a pretty steady stream of results sort of from the 60s through like the 70s, proving this conjecture for small values of that. So proving it for n equals three, proving it for n equals four, proving it for n equals five. Uh, I should note that it's very important that we say real because there are very small examples for which this does not hold over the complex numbers. But it doesn't hold, but maybe two n will hold. No, it will not. So what uh, these examples? What do they show us? In not it's not uh, it's not clear. So it's clear it's polynomial. Or... It's not clear. I mean, so I mean, polynomial over the complex would imply a better bound than no. No, no, it, it's a counterexample. So. Ah, it's a counterexample. Um. So, what what other dimensions of the examples? Uh, so you get an example for just n equals three. But what is the highest dimension of the example? Okay, I mean as high as as high as you care to compute. There are examples that were rife with examples, and I will get to those. If you tensor them with each other, too. Hmm? if you tensor an example with each other, it's... no. So in general, that is not. So that would be great if us uh, sort of tensoring maintained this uh, property. So tensoring with a Sylvester construction of Hadamard does maintain this. No, I meant just you, you have some counter example over the complex number, say the tensor is good itself. Yeah, this is in general not going to be completely pivot. It's not going to be what? So it's not going to it's not going to satisfy our pivoting conditions in general. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, you're not guaranteed. In fact, I I wish if only this would be true. For instance, but uh, a side note is that uh, this property is actually true for uh, rook pivoting, which is sort of in between partial and complete pivoting, their tensors do sort of maintain this property. But, but if you say what you mean? So if you take a completely pivoted matrix, you take another completely pivoted matrix, you uh, take their tensor, that is not necessarily a completely pivoted matrix. It, it is going to hold in the same row and column, but it's not going to hold in the lower right block. Okay. Yeah. But uh, the bad news is, unfortunately, this conjecture was proven to be false. And I use the words proven very lightly. Uh, in 1990, in the 1990s, uh, Nick Gould, using uh, the nonlinear optimization software Lancelot, came up with a 13 by 13 example which achieved a value of like 13.02 in floating point arithmetic. Uh, later, Alan Edelman uh, took this example and verified it through uh, symbolic operations in MATLAB and, I'm sorry, Maple and Mathematica. But uh, very much this conjecture is false, but still there's no understanding as to what does this growth look like as n gets very large, of course, you can take any finite example. Tensors do hold when you tensor with a Hadamard matrix. So you can always sort of double a construction you have. So whichever, so if it breaks it for you know, n equals 13, it's broken for 26, it's broken for uh, 52 and so on and so forth. But uh, it's only broken, like the amount it's broken by doesn't scale. And uh, an open problem that still remains and posed by uh, Nick Hyam in his, uh, in his book is still trying to understand this limit of uh, the maximum growth, let's say over. So the gap is uh, quite large. I should say that uh, recently some work of myself and Alan Edelman, uh, we've been able to show that this is uh, at least two. So it breaks the conjecture and it breaks it by, you know, multiplicative factor of sort of two. So infinite the maximum is over all non-singular yeah. matrices. Under complete pivoting. Of, of size n. Of size n. 
But uh, and you got the lower bound. A lower bound, bound which is two. two. Yeah. But but still, there's there's not a single there's not a single very nice construction. Every single construction that gives you some lower bound is sort of created in some very ugly looking way. And so, one of the sort of like big questions is: Is it generic in some sense? Like that, like those the say the the set of uh, the set of A is such that the G A is larger than some one point five. Mm -hmm. Is it uh, like it has a big portion in the manifold? Of the not at, not at all clear. I would guess not. You think is the best in terms of A? Yeah. Still, this is another great question. Do you even know that this is probably really dumb, but do you even know just the question of if you want to decompose A and sorry, L, L and U? Do you even know? Don't know. Well, no. I mean, you get this this, forget about the this high and lower bound holds for any good thing as you saw, but in general, no. And sort of all the sort of like literature is specifically around these two things because these are things that you can do quickly. But uh, the theoretical question of just asking over the entire set is also a That's all I've got for you. All right. All right. Okay. So I just think the problem exists for, for 2000 years almost, and we don't know the answer. Actually. And we don't know the answer, and mainly, you know, this is uh, yeah. things like if this is something that looks interesting to you, we uh, cry for help. help. If, you, if, you, yeah, uh, if you were using the normal uh, condition number, what is the how bad does uh, you know, these people think to do this type of thing? But this is true for condition number. So, you know, ratio of uh, uh, largest uh, singular value of A versus the largest uh, of the singular value of A. So, your question is how does sort of. Uh, oh, you're asking. You're generating from uh, A, let's mm -hmm. say, tell you the composition. Mm -hmm. Oh, and you want to uh, say I'm for. Asking about there, uh, yeah. You're, okay, so to make sure that I follow completely, you're asking for, let's say, well conditioned. I can see how this really be, How ill conditioned can the factors be given, you know, that the condition, the bounded condition number, let's say, for A? How unbounded can it be? Something like that. I so you focused on in, in this role, right? Mm -hmm. And the ratios of the mark mm -hmm. I'm just wondering about this, uh, the eigenvalue. Mm -hmm. uh, let me think for a second. That is a good question. I don't know. I don't know of any results that uh, that say. Actually, this is a question we are asked in the fall. We were actually asked the same question. I don't know of any results that say I fix conditioning to be, you know, of this level. Now tell me how bad can this get? And this is this sort of result is not known. So why are they focused on the maximum entry? Why is this the parameter big to to study to death and not condition? I just want to it's not in America the algebra, the most important parameter is the usual condition. Yeah, no, I mean, condition number, of course, is important. In some sense, I imagine why this was sort of of interest to sort of early people in numerical linear algebra is because you get a matrix. You can't change the condition number, but you can choose some strategy, which in both cases, you can choose strategies. Yeah, okay. In yeah. both cases, so, yeah. So the question is which parameters are we studying? Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know why they focus on the largest entry as opposed to. Oh, I should say, if what you're asking is, are there results about how Gosh elimination performs with respect to condition number? Yeah, there are. What I'm saying is, well, I'm asking the question. Of, I'm answering the question of, for a given condition number, 
how badly does growth behave? So this result I wrote, which I erased earlier, which was this, uh, this first proof I gave, you can sort of, using this estimate, you can show that like, you can multiply like condition number and growth factor. And so as condition number gets worse, your estimate is just going to degrade like linearly. Okay. No question. All right, thanks. Okay.